So it is 6.30, and I think we are ready to go. Right, David? Yeah. Um, uh, just a reminder that the very first part of tonight's meeting is going to be a public hearing on the uh, preliminary special assessment report for the Folsom Street reconstruction. Um, and I'm assuming that's what everybody's here for, right? Okay. Uh, maybe something else. And so this should not take too long, and then we will move into our uh, regular meeting for tonight. So um, I am now opening the public hearing, and our city clerk will take the roll call. All right. Present. Arnold. Present. Gray. Present. Motive. Present. Reed. Here. Steiner. Here. Rolke is excused. So tonight's open, uh, public hearing has been um, noticed in uh, conjunction with state statutes and local ordinances. So uh, I am now calling our public hearing to be open. And um, if there is anybody who would like to uh, talk about the uh, preliminary special assessment report for the Folsom Street reconstruction, this would be a time for you to come forward and talk. <laughs> so is anybody interested? Doesn't look like anyone signed up for that uh, specific reason tonight. So um, one more announcement. If anyone would like to speak tonight at our public hearing, we would be delighted to hear from you. And if not, we will close the public hearing. Pardon me? Oh, yes. Uh, we need to start our next meeting at 635. And so we will now adjourn the public hearing. We are going to wait three minutes. That was a very quick public hearing. We're going to wait three minutes for the beginning of the regular meeting because that is what it was advertised at. And we don't want to leave anyone out who is planning to get here uh, to speak tonight. If anyone who has just come in would like to sign up to speak tonight, we can certainly accommodate you. Um, just let us know if you'd like to do that and you haven't had a chance. And we will, well. We still have to, we still have to make a motion to adjourn the meeting. We do need to, I'm just trying to kill some time here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, because, man, time goes slowly. It's, uh, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn this uh, public hearing. Motive will make a motion to <laughs> adjourn the hearing. Read, um, read will second. So it has moved and seconded that we adjourn the public hearing. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. Uh, all those in favor, do we need to do a roll call to adjourn the meeting? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, so we are now adjourned, and now you have two minutes to wait before we start the regular meeting. So you could go quickly get a drink or... Paul, oh, there's a chair over. I will take a minute to just thank everyone for coming tonight. It's great to see so many people here. We appreciate it when the public decides to to come in and express their opinions. And we will um, we will allow time for everyone who has signed up to speak tonight. Um, we have ten people, so we're going to ask you to just maybe try to keep it to about three minutes per person if you can do that. And we have one minute to go. And did you just arrive now? Did you want to sign up to speak? Or did you have a chance to do that? Okay, good. Okay. So it is now 635. I want to welcome you all to uh, 
tonight's uh, Common Council meeting. It's Tuesday, March 21st, 2023. And our city clerk, Pat Gable, will now take the roll. Albright? Present. Arnold? Present. Gray? Present. Modif? Present. Reed? Here. Steiner? Here. And Rolke is excused. So if you are able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So uh, tonight's meeting has been noticed in accordance with state statutes and local ordinances, and I'm looking for a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Alder Gray moves to approve the agenda. Motive will second. So it's been moved and seconded that we approve tonight's agenda. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Um, this is the part of the meeting where we will uh, start having people who signed up to speak to um, begin to do that. Um, I'm going to just run down the list in order that you signed in. When you get to the podium, is it turned on now? No. Our first speaker is Max Chu, and I think Max, there no, you go. It's on now. It's Max. on now, Max. So would you please give your name and your address? Sure. My name is Max Chu. I live at 321 Fairway Drive. Um, great turnout. My goodness. My wife said, hey, uh, there might be more people than you expect, and she was right. So there you go, publicly. Um, I am here just to say I would l really deeply appreciate, um, at a very important level, updates on the plan for stormwater planning. Because I've lived in two cities now where I've seen neighborhoods, streets fall down in dry weather because of water running below. And I'm deeply concerned to the point where I'd be considering moving out of Columbus over this. It's not because we don't have great people. I do appreciate you guys a lot more than you realize for all the craziness that we endure, we've endured these last couple of years. But I need to know, after all the great work that we have gotten done, all the great information that has been accumulated, what is the actionable plan? What is the timeline? Where is the funding for this? Because whether or not there is a utility created, whether or not there is an avenue for it immediately, great intentions, but a lack of planning is going to potentially devastate my personal finances. I can't have that and I'm not gonna risk it. I'm not a gambler. So please, when able, I don't need it right now, but I need a plan. I need to know, I need to know what the timeline is so I can make wise decisions based on that. Thank you so much. And thank you very much. Um, our uh, next person on the list, I, if I'm reading this right, is it David Sh Steyer? It's okay. And again, would you please state your name and your address for us? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Dave Steyer. I don't yet live in Columbus, but I hope to. My address is 982 Shore Acres Road, Arnold, Maryland. All right, good evening, Mayor Arnold, uh, esteemed dollars and people of Columbus. My name is Dave Stira, uh, and my partner Brian and I were the other parties bidding for the dingy estate. Uh, we first want to extend our thanks to the people of Columbus uh, and everyone else for being so supportive of our plan. The many comments and private messages has truly been humbling, and we appreciate that very much. Listen, I I'm not here to tell you how to spend your money, because I grew up in a small town a lot like Columbus, and I know that the way to get things done is not to come in with fire and brimstone and tell people that they're wrong and that you know better. So that's not what I'm here to do. Um, I'm simply here to advocate for my plan and express my sincere hope that the historic property uh, not be torn down in favor of housing development. Our plan first and foremost was to become citizens of Columbus. We saw the dingy estate as our forever home and the future site of a veteran owned small business. I actually shared the listing with a friend of mine uh, who said, man, there's a lifetime of work to do on that property. And that's what I wanted to do, and that's why I bid on the property, because I wanted that lifetime of work, and I wanted to make it my project to restore it to what it used to be. Our vision was to plant lavender in the east field and to have an apiary to produce local honey. The smaller barn we saw as a B&B, &B, and the larger barn we envisioned as an event space. We had hoped to connect our clients with other local businesses, such as entertainers, artists, and food service professionals here in Columbus. Though our plan was still in its infancy, and though it certainly would not be accomplished overnight, we welcomed the challenge, and we did want to make it a lifetime's worth of work. 
I had two productive conversations with the city planner's office who were very helpful in explaining what would have to happen in order to make the dream a reality, in addition to explaining a lot of the zoning regulations. And I do appreciate that. In terms of the transaction, we were led to believe that there had not been much interest in this property, that we should put down a number and negotiate from there. We did that. Then we removed our inspection contingency at the request of the estate and increased our offer by over 10%. We thought we were engaging in a good faith negotiation when suddenly we learned that there was another buyer in the mix and that their offer had been accepted. Our offer at the time was 559000 The city's offer was 560000 The listing agent and personal representative of the estate refused to hear any further offers. And to this moment, I question why people in their positions would refuse to hear higher offers from their clients, for their clients, excuse me. The fate of this property is now in the hands of the people of Columbus and their elected representatives. Even if Brian and I are out of the picture, I sincerely hope that you choose to keep and restore this historic property rather than knocking down a community icon in favor of cookie cutter houses. Thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak to you all tonight. Thank you. So the next person on the list is Elizabeth Gilbertson. I'm Elizabeth Gilbertson from 548 South Charles Street here in Columbus. So growing up in Columbus in the 60s and 70s, we were known for our canning company, our 4th of July parade, the drum and bugle corps competitions, our big J.C. Penny store, our annual fireman's park picnic, and our popcorn wagon that was parked in the four corners to list a few. These are things that brought families from other communities into Columbus to support our economic growth and spend time in our city. With the ideas and visions of two people who want to move to Columbus and because they found a property that they love and have a vision for, which is the Dingy Farm, our community could have a new reason to bring families to our city to spend time and money in. The vision board of this project would not only allow the property to be restored but kept intact while providing a beautiful landscape when entering Columbus. It would also generate revenue for the community and be a destination with, our, with the local business ideas of a lavender farm, honey production, and event venue. All while protecting and preserving our local history. The Digi Farm, as we all call it, dates back to the late 1800s and our city's last farmstead within the city limits of Columbus. Let's be the community that other families come to because we have an experience that they can't get where they live. Let's be the community that has its last standing farmstead in the city limits restored and functional. Let's be the community that is going to have a spark to hopefully ignite others to do the same, just like the communities around us are doing now. I encourage the decision makers involved in the purchase of the Dingy Farm to sit back and just take a breath and look at alternative resources for development. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on the list is Ann Elenfelt. I thought you were going to say Annabelle. <laughs> Hello. My name is Annie Ellenfeld. I live at 160 Inglesby Street, right here in Columbus, and I'm almost a lifelong liver, and not a liver, <laughs> person, <laughs> person who lives in Columbus. <laughs> After the Columbus Area Historic Society was formed, I became interested in the history and preservation of this whole area, Columbus and Fall River. Please understand, however, that I am not here tonight as a, uh, an advocate of the society. I'm speaking just personally for myself. Um, and the reason I'm doing it is because I've decided in my life it's important to preserve history. I am not sure many local residents or how many local residents realize that the Dingy Farm on Business 151, as you head out of Madison, is the only intact farm, and Libby did, you realize that now, because Libby did say that, the only intact um, farmstead left in the city limits of Columbus. There were a number of them. <clears throat> This farmstead has been owned by, I believe, approximately six different families in the period of 162 years. The Italianate house is, uh, was built in 1861, and it is one of the older homes left in Columbus. There aren't a lot older than that anymore. 
The farmstead began as a, uh, a stock farm raising cattle and then became a specialty farm uh, for two of the families that lived there. And that specialty was raising horses. And the reason they raised horses was because there was um, harness horse racing in Columbus at that time. And they raised the horses to race in Columbus. So you see, there's a bit of history here. Goes back a long time. I sure would not like to see this old farmstead with the 1861 historical house destroyed. That's why I'm here to ask you city council members to please consider and reconsider what you've started here. I think a lot of the citizens in Columbus are not different than me in that they would like the history of Columbus to be here. And I'd like to see that property not be forgotten history. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next person on the list is Joe Hammer. Good evening, everybody. My name is Joe Hammer. I live at uh, 162 East School Street here in Columbus, and I would like to talk about the purchase of the Dingy property. With the city going after the Dingy property, it raises some questions. What is the plan of use for this property? What mo uh, money is being used for the purchase? It was stated in social media by a council member that no city taxpayer funds were being used. If that's the case, is it the ARPA funds, which are the COVID funds for people that are not uh, aware of the ARPA term. Um, purchase of land is not an intended use of that money. And how does the city, uh, has the city done an analysis of what the added cost of building demolition and infrastructure installation would be? The city purchased the land along Tower Drive and Western Avenue a couple of years ago with no direct plan for its intended use, property off the tax roll. In purchasing the dingy property, it is another piece of land off the tax roll. We can't increase our tax base if we keep taking property off of our tax base. If the city keeps overbidding other private bids, what developer is going to want to consider coming into Columbus if they have to p uh, compete with the city itself? There are a lot of questions concer uh, that concerned citizens are looking for. The, uh, after the vote of last week, you could have probably uh, curbed some of those uh, concerns if you would have had a statement immediately saying that you had an intended use and you stated what, uh, what funds were being used. The city had a comprehensive uh, stormwater study done with multiple projects identified, some pricey, uh, others low cost. Citizens told that there was no money for the projects at these times, yet $560,000 appears to purchase land. ARPA funds? I hope you take this all into consideration of this when you take action on Resolution 223. Also, an explanation for the city's reasoning for selling off the parcel of land that was dedicated for the future fire station and training facility. Transparency seems to be the issue here, and now is the time to address it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Tim Vandehey. Can I speak in his place? I'm his wife. Oh, sure. You bet. <laughs> Just tell us your name and address. Hi. Um, this was last minute for me, so I don't have anything prepared, but my name is Connie Vandehey, and I live at 429 Vista Circle in Columbus. So my husband and I have been in this community for four years and absolutely love this community. Like, to me, it's Mayberry. When you go to the local pharmacy and you can sit and have a coffee, and it just has that hometown charm feel. And that farm is part of that feel for me every time I drive past it. My husband and I used to work in Madison and have jobs, and they were so, so stressful. But we would drive out here, and you could just feel the stress melting away. Please don't take that farm. 
please give it to the other people there. And being that we live up on Vista Boulevard, I've seen the flooding. The minute we moved in, the flooding was horrible for the people below and for us, we had no route into our home whatsoever. So I think the money would be better spent on the storm system and the ro road repair. It's definitely needed here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next is William Orchard. Uh, my name's William Orchard. I live at 106 Greenview Drive. I'm here tonight to talk about the purchase of the dingy property. I don't feel the city of Columbus has a responsibility to enter into development of residential property. Uh, this should be left up to private development companies. The city of Columbus is known for historic nature and tourists, traveling to the city and supporting local businesses. The site is located on a main thoroughfare into the city with numerous homes that have maintained their historical authenticity. I would like to see this continue on this property. There are other concerns, for example, flooding and road maintenance that I believe uh, should have a higher priority with the city of Columbus and should be addressed as they relate to public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Rohde. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor. Before we uh, start my clock, I'd like to take a second to say a quick thank you, if I could. Um, last Friday, when this whole thing blew up, I reached out to both of my alders and, and to yourself as well. And I'd like to thank Sarah, Sarah Modif and only Sarah Modif for taking the time to sit down with me and have a, a cup of coffee. Um, I hope you're okay, Mayor. I, it's unlike you to not return a call. So maybe you, maybe you didn't get it. Did you email me? I called, I called your, your phone. So, um, so I'm glad to see oh, you I'm, here. I'm, I'm glad so to sorry. Hear you're okay. I, I, uh, Mr. Gray, I'm glad to see you're well okay. On Friday, Mr. Gray told me that he was too sick to meet with me on an issue like this, but two days later he was healthy enough to have a listening session with a bunch of community members. So I'm, I'm glad to see that you're feeling better, but I'm cautious that your eye might be more concerned on the chair next to you than the one that you're in right now. When we've got an issue that affects citizens in the entire community and in your district that you represent, I expect more from an alder and from a veteran. So let's start the clock, Mayor. <clears throat> glad to see you're okay. We all know that this came up really quickly. In a matter of four or five days, we had 373 comments on social media. 90% of them were dissenting to this. Um, Trina, you got beat up for asking a question. And, and let me tell you, I'm sorry for that, that you had the smartest question in the room. And we'll get to that in just a second. But the issue at hand is that we're, the city is looking at buying this property. Now, for years, we've talked about local business development. We've got some outside entity that wants to come in, buy a property, veteran owned, build a business in, here, in town and, and make a run of it. And we had a closed door session where the city outbid the property by about $1,000 is my understanding. We have a realtor who closed the bidding to further bids or to counter offers. Typically, it seems like a realtor's job is to maximize the revenue for the property. I think I'm not a realtor. Um, we've got a selling agent who represents the family who is also a property owner of four acres, 1200 feet away from this property, who is also a part owner of a development firm in a neighboring town who actually just as of today, March 21st, 23rd, became the officer of that company, the registered officer of that company. It seems like a gray area. It seems shady to me, probably nothing illegal, but I think it's worth a closer look as to who the players are and how this is going down. It doesn't, it seems like there's maybe more light that we want to shed on the situation. And Trina, to your question, the offer on the table is for $560,000. 
I've spoken to real, real estate developers, yep. and I know for a fact that there were a couple of offers on this property in the neighbor of 450, and the reason for that is because they have to pay for the mitigate, the concrete removal and the silo removal. And they know that any developer who okay. does this for a living knows that to turn a profit, they need to get into the property for about 450,000. We're offering 560. That doesn't seem like it, like we know everything, right? So when we're looking at the city who is now in the business of flipping properties or developing properties, which is not really city business. We've got multiple offers from developers who know more than the city. We've got, we're stifling outside businesses from, from tax revenue that could come into the, the, the city who want to restore a historic building. We've got a realtor who won't accept another bid. We've got a closed door bid from the city. We have another party who just became the agent of a development company today and we've got a local icon that we run the risk of losing. We've got 350 people dissenting on social media about this city product. We've got a city government that doesn't have a plan, as Mr. Hammer pointed out. And we've got a Tower Drive property that we haven't developed yet. I'm asking you to press pause. We need to shed some light into this gray situation. We want to know what's going on. Thank, Thank you. you. Ruth Hermanson. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm here tonight as Ruth Ann Hermanson, 986 Warner Street, Columbus, Wisconsin. I'm very tied to this town and um, listening to all of you, I'm, I'm waiting to hear somebody that's pro this and I'm not hearing that. Um, I'd like to also, I don't like to compare ourselves to our neighbors, but um, Quivy's Grove and the Sipo Music and Art Center in Beaver Dam and the Sun Prairie Theater Group years ago restored their old barns and old houses in town and made a cultural center or as David wants to make his home there and have these events. Um, as far as the water retention, I'll just say that because it's across the street. I remember when the development went in, my grandma talked about the marsh. What this Parkview needs, and it needed a long time ago, is a couple simple retention ponds. I'm sick of water going down the river and rising ocean levels, and I think I'd like you all to think of it. My main reason for coming tonight is um, the Dingies were close friends of mine. I'll quickly share this. He asked me to run for Miss Columbus and Rotary would sponsor me. I get very nervous. I was sick as an infant and I tremble. It's called a familiar tremble. And I told him I, I shake too much. So in his honor, I wrote a poem and I will share this tonight. Hear our past asking why. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. I come here this evening to express my concern and feelings, looking into all your eyes and asking you all why. Many of you have beautiful historic homes. You cherish the craftsmanship, beauty, and thrones. Your labor of love, your stewardship, your best in time. Honoring your past, you are so inclined. You brought these homes for many reasons. Beauty unfolds with each season. Old homes, quiet, tree-lined neighborhoods, you see a community is understood. Columbus is a historic gold mine. Beauty surrounds us as we, fl we reflect and we shine. Places that honor the efforts of our past, home and places built to last. Not now at our doorstep is a couple like all of you wanting to take care of the dingy treasure and Sue's. They have a good plan for you to embrace, to honor, preserve what is now in place. An old beauty restored to perfection, old barns and repurposed for new generations. More jobs and a place for lavender fields a gathering place for all it yields. 
to welcome all to Columbus, can't you see? This, of a fa this farmstead is meant to be. Please give this farm a second chance. Housing can be made with much better finance. And a better place is just down the road, but this is the last place a farm, a home. To witness as we all drive by, to be honored and kept for all time. Please do not let this go by. Now tell me your reasons why. You want this torn down and our history thrown aside. Our past citizens, our past spiritual citizens simply cry. Thank you. And the next person is Tom Brennan. Hello, council members. Um, just like to say uh, I live at 422 West Prairie Street here in Columbus, and my wife and I have lived here for the last 10 years. And we really enjoy the community and the people that are uh, here um, in Columbus. Um, I was concerned, like everyone else has been and has spoken about this, uh, the, prop the property uh, and the development in the city uh, making an offer and apparently an accepted offer on this property. Um, I had a lot of questions, and that's really why I'm here, to have some questions answered. Uh, I'm not going to go either side of this at this point to some degree, but I did reach out to Mr. Gray, and I appreciated your email uh, the other day in um, trying to dispel some things you, you know you hear on social media, whether they're true or not, and um, that's my purpose was to reach out to you in that time and get some answers. Um, you had indicated to me that the city's plan uh, was, was for this property to have 15 plus possible single uh, sanity homes and townhouse style condos in this area as well um, and possibly saving the existing home. Uh, I think I know as well as everybody in this room when you get a developer in there most likely you're not going to be able to save uh, that that home. It's just not going to be probably even feasible. So my questions here that I have uh, that I put forth to you and I'd like to get some answers tonight uh, just to clarify where's the money coming from to purchase this project you know to purchase this uh, piece of land what's the projected revenue if you go ahead with this um, for the city I you know I'd like to hear some of those numbers if that's anything what's the timeline on the on the uh, city's development of this area you know and I hear questions or I hear statements about you know, there's other property in town here that's not being developed as well. So I have some questions about that. Um, I don't, I, my bottom line is here, I don't think the city of Columbus should be in the business of real estate, buying real estate. And the money could be used, uh, obviously, for street development and other flood, other flood projects that are here that are needed in the community. So... <laughs> Hopefully, I can get some answers uh, from you tonight in those in those perspectives. So, all right, I thank you and appreciate thank your you. time. Okay, is there anyone else who did not have a chance to sign up who would like to speak? Yeah, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dominic Famularo. Some of you know of me, some of you don't. 324 West Mill. Um, it's a great turnout here tonight. We all have the same questions. We all have the same concerns. Unfortunately, we're not going to get the answers we want, and we all know how this is going to play out with the council. They've already made their minds up. You all have made up your minds, with the exception of the one person who had the common sense to not vote for this. We have a liar who keeps ping-ponging back and forth on whether the city said something or didn't or how they meant it. We have an empty suit. We have... Dominic, I'm going to ask you to please be respectful in your comments. I am. No, you're not. I am. So Thank please. You. So going forward, we had a meetings done in closed session where it wasn't necessary. Closed session meetings are very specific. None of this should have been done in the extent that it was in closed session. 
the fact that this was exploited by this council is disgusting and appalling. You should all be ashamed of yourselves for going behind the backs of the citizens that you're here to represent, with the exception of you, Trina. I'm gonna let you off the hook on this one. But the rest of you should be ashamed of yourselves. You have a process and a procedure you're supposed to follow, and you never do it except for when you want to. We have an alder, Mr. Gray, who has often said with stormwater utility, we can't fund it until we have a plan. But we can buy $560,000 worth of property without a plan. Well, we have a plan, we don't have a plan, we have a plan, whatever he decides to say that day. We can't keep working this way, guys. We can't keep letting this happen. And to see all of you here today, to speak your minds and support each other, and be unified as one cause, which, you know, we have one candidate for mayor that wants to unify people. He's doing a good job by pissing off both sides. So with that said, I hope you guys take into consideration what your jobs are, how you're supposed to do them, and who you represent other than yourselves. Thank you. Actually, this is really not a question and answer time. It's a time for people to express their opinion. Uh, I would say if you have a question, um, your alder or someone could perhaps meet with you after the meeting. But we, okay, we really. Could I, could I express an opinion because I didn't have my full three minutes? I think for this huge of a purchase, this should have been put up for a vote before the community. Uh, we, we, if, um, I guess I'd like some direction from the council here. It, I, I, I know we really w do not want to get into a back and forth. Um, and I think if you are interested in s having time to speak and you did not sign up, you may. I did, you know, allow Mr. Famalaro to do that. If you would like to go and speak, that we will allow those who want to to do that. But we really don't want to get into a back and forth question and answer. So is there... Pardon me? I'm sorry? Give us a forum to speak more than two minutes, please. Uh, that could, that's a possibility, will but. Be on the Committee of the Whole agenda, so that's a good time to, if you want to stick around and get answers. But like Mary said, there are a couple of people that looks like they didn't get to sign up. Would I you like to? Kelly and Helen's hands. Yes. And Bob. Go ahead. Um, my name is Bob O'Brien. Many, many of you probably know me. Um, I live in Columbus at 145 East James Street. I am a former city employee. I worked for the city for 24 years, <clears throat> but I'm also the caretaker of the dingy property. And I've been the caretaker for 45 years. And I just wanted to introduce myself. I still have keys to the house, so if anyone would like to see the house or the property, you have the right to contact me um, until this is closed. I don't think the closing has taken place. Ian, are you saying I don't have that property? You would have to have the sellers. The current owners are the trust. You would have to have their permission to show it. You don't own the property. Who are the current owners? The trust. I have their per permission. Okay. Yep. So until it's officially closed, you know, the sale is closed, I guess I have the right to show people if they're interested in seeing the house. Um, if you want, you can write my phone number down, 920-623-2281, and just get in contact with me and we go out and see it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are going to move on now. Oh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, and Helen sure. did too. Kelly Crombie, 641 North Ludington. We had spoke um, two or three weeks ago. I appreciate Mary, Ian, and um, Kyle for giving me the opportunity to meet to discuss, uh, you know, various things in the city. And I think that, you know, one thing I brought up was the uh, city buying the property. And I think, um, you know, Ian said we don't, doesn't mean we should stop trying just because the city 
has had problems in the past with owning property. And I think that's a, a fair point. And I think that, uh, you know, while there's a lot of questions still about buying property and, and everything, I think that one thing that um, just encouraged the council to move forward with developing it, I think it's already been been purchased. I think, you know, the city is going to own the property. You know, I, while I probably wasn't in favor of that, I think that's where this is heading. And I think that, you know, given the uh, severe requirements that the state put on municipalities starting in 2003 with tying tax levy increases to net new construction, I, I get what the city is trying to do. I get where, where they're headed with this. Um, so just, you know, I know on the cow we're going to talk about uh, actually developing it, and I think that you know that's a, a positive a positive step. And so just uh, try to you know keep um, moving forward on this project. So thank you, thank Kelly. You. Thank you. And did Helen also? <gasps> okay. Hey everyone, my name is Helen Clack. I live at 649 West Narrow Street. And I didn't really sign up because I didn't really have much to say about this topic. Um, but I do feel like I have some things to say now. I do want to take out two points. Um, I own a small business here in Columbus. I own Tea Time Wine Barn Bakery. And I'm going to tell you as a small business owner, as I'm sure almost every small business, or actually every business that has like a food or beverage service here in Columbus, we need more people to survive. Like, it's, it's not like we're living in Madison where it's packed all the time. You know, like if you go out at 5 o'clock on a Thursday night to get dinner, you can get seated or, you know, wait 45 minutes in Madison. You know, many times um, our bar is almost empty. And, you know, I drive past other bars and they have similar issues as well. So I do think that's a, a valid point to make, a, a different side that maybe not everybody sees. We need people. In order to get people here, we need more housing. I'm also a real estate agent. I know that housing is like nothing right now. Somebody wants to move to Columbus, well, guess what? Wait in line. So um, I don't care how that's done. I, I do obviously have a, a passion for history. You know, I've renovated my own house, which is a 1850s carriage house, and actually um, right down the street from Terry Sweets, which is the governor's mansion. Um, so we've renovated that, kept with the history. I've renovated the Tea Time Wine Bar and Bakery, which is the old fireman's. It's actually, I believe, the oldest building in Columbus. It was built in 1852, I think. It might be 1862, but it's one of the oldest downtown. And we're working on a fourth, well, a fifth, which is the Whitney property, which we purchased from Bob O'Brien. Thanks, Bob. Um, so I have a passion in that. And I get what you're saying, but we also need development. Whether this is the spot for that, it might not be. But going into the history, I'm also on the agenda for the auditorium. So a lot of people are saying that they love the history. We need to renovate it. We have something right upstairs that's been sitting there, and nobody's cared enough to, well, a few people have cared enough, but never push it forward. So if we're all willing to come out here today um, to get this lovely couple their dingy property, can we also put that same effort forward to get the lovely auditorium above us, which would also, to Libby's point, make this a destination town? People would come here, just like the Stoughton Opera House. We will have plays. The kids would get to graduate there. You know, your grandson or your son and daughter would be able to have their choir concert up there. You know, and it's sitting up there in shambles right now. I, I'm eventually it's going to leak right through here. So we need to have that same type of passion in that respect as well. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> And now I think we are going to move on to the consent agenda. So I am looking for a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda. Alder Bodef will make a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda. Alder Steiner can second. And so it's just an aside, guys, the Committee of the Whole is where we'll actually be talking about things if you want substantive information. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. So it has been moved and seconded that we approve the consent agenda. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, we are going to be moving on to new business. Um, our first uh, item of new business tonight is to consider and take action on the special assessment report for the Folsom Street uh, reconstruction. And is Jason here? 
Oh, Jason, you want to just uh, if be available. Does anyone have any questions for Jason about the? Uh, we have talked about this at a number of meetings, but just in case, is anyone interested in any? I would, yeah, Jason, can you go through it quick just so that everybody that is watching, they understand so that they yeah. they know what's going on. Good point. Okay, I'll hit some highlights off of memory here because I don't have it right in front of me. Um, I will say that in 16 years of doing this, I've never had a public hearing without a speaker. So that was very interesting for me tonight. But obviously other things going on tonight as well. Uh, as for the special assessment, oh, thanks, Kyle. Uh, just run through this quick. This is pretty standard for what we've done. It's a pretty straightforward project as well. Uh, again, the items that were identified for special assessment were full cost of curb and gutter, uh, full cost for concrete driveway aprons, so that was the driveway for each individual, individual residence, um, full cost for the sidewalk through the driveway, so the short piece of sidewalk that makes up that driveway that people drive across, and then the sidewalk outside of that uh, is picked up about 50% by the community and then the other 50% was divided amongst both sides of the street. In this case, with one sidewalk on one side of the street, it was split essentially 25 and 25% with the residents. Uh, and then 15% of the storm sewer costs of the affected properties or benefited properties in this case. Uh, with Folsom Street, all the properties on Folsom Street fit into one stormwater system. So the 15% was just the total stormwater cost times 15% divided amongst residents based on their property frontage. Again, this is uh, assessment by the state statute uh, for benefited properties, and we use the street frontage assessment to do that. So those are the items that were included. Uh, in your preliminary special assessment, there's the preliminary resolution you guys passed, the map of the project limits, uh, the construction bid items that were all included. This was inclusive of everything, not just the assessed items. Um, I would say those who have been paying attention, we got great bid prices this year for construction. Uh, so that helped keep prices slightly down uh, for the assessments. And then the report goes into uh, an explanation of those costs, exactly how those items were assessed and which bid items were assessed. Again, I kind of covered those up front, but there's a few more details in there because we break the storm sewer down into integral components of that uh, related to manholes and pipes and inlets and things like that. Um, as the special assessment uh, comes through the, um, the amount, I have my glasses here, 60 some thousand dollars was specially assessed out of 500 some thousand dollars. So again, I believe the total assessment was about 11% of the project cost. Uh, the city picks up the other um, Eighty-nine percent of the project cost uh, through the regular funding process. Uh, so, with that, um, I just, I guess, I'll open it up for questions. I know there's a lot of specific details to each one of the special assessed items and/or the properties. Uh, but again, I obviously nobody spoke tonight in favor or opposition of it. So, um, hopefully, we we did it well enough that it answered most of everybody's questions. So, any any questions for me on the report? No, thank you, and thank you for summing it all up for us. Yeah. Um, and so I am looking for a motion to ap approve the special assessment report. Uh, I was, no, I was just saying I. Oh, uh, I'll make a motion to approve the special assessment report. Task order. Oh, and uh, sorry about that. And task order. Uh, well, are we going to do that now? We're actually out of order with that one. That's what I thought. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. Under new business, oh, the first sorry. item I'm is just. Ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Get okay. Ahead of so I am just making a motion to approve the Folsom Street special assessment report. Okay. Alder Albright will second that. So it has been moved and seconded that we approve the special assessment report for the Folsom Street reconstruction. Is there any discussion? Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, item under number two is to consider and take action on resolu sorry, resolution 2-23, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of Columbus authorizing the purchase of certain land from the Doris Dingy Estate. So I am looking for a motion 
to approve the resolution to purchase the land. Alder Gray moves to approve resolution number 2-23. Alder Steinick can second. So it has been moved and seconded that we approve uh, resolution 2-23 uh, as noted, and we will do a roll call on this. Gray? Aye. Motive? Aye. Reed? Nay. Steiner? Aye. Albright? Nay. Motion carries three to two. Okay, and now we are going to move on to number three, which is the task order relating to <clears throat> the Folsom's, Folsom Street construction project. So this is task order number 2023-1. And um, I am looking for a motion to approve the task order for the reconstruction. Alder Steiner can make a motion to approve the task order for Folsom Street construction project. Uh, Alder Gray seconds to approve task order 2023-1. Uh, it has been moved and seconded that we approve the task order. Is there any discussion? Um, we'll do a roll call on this one also. Gray? Aye. Motive? Aye. Reed? Aye. Steiner? Aye. Albright? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, and now we are going down to item number four, which is to consider and take action on the 2023 CBO Athletic Field Agreement. And CBO stands for Columbus... <laughs> Baseball, organization. Baseball organization. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, uh, <clears throat> Amy Joe, did you have anything you wanted to add to this uh, agreement tonight, or do you think we're... No, we're carrying it forward from last meeting. Okay. No changes this year. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Amy Jo on this agreement? Um, okay, and it is something we have discussed, so... Uh, like I said, the Committee of the Whole is the meeting where there's actual conversation on it. So I am looking for a motion to take action on the 2023 CBO Athletic Field Agreement. Alder Gray moves to approve the 2023 CBO Athletic Field Agreement. Reed will second. So it's been moved and seconded that we approve this uh, agreement. Is there any discussion, any questions? Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, the next item, uh, number five, is to consider and take action on the 2023 Columbus Softball Association Athletic Field Agreement. And again, this is something that Amy Jo has given us quite a bit of information on. If anyone has any questions for her, she's here. Otherwise, if not, I am looking for a motion to approve it. Alder Steinick can make a motion to approve the 2023 CSA Athletic Field Agreement. Motive will second. So it's been moved and seconded that we um, approve the 2023 CSA Athletic Field Agreement. Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And the, item number six on the agenda is to consider and take action on the 2023 Columbus F. Well, uh, Columbus let me make Area Youth Soccer, youth soccer organization. organization, the CASO Athletic Field Agreement. Again, this is an item that we've received information about from. Amy Jo, does anyone have any questions for her? And if not, I am looking for a motion to approve it. Alder Gray moves to approve the 2023 uh, Case of Athletic Field Agreement. Alder Motive will second. So it's been moved and seconded that we approve the 2023 Case of Athletic Field Agreement. Um, any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? And um, item number seven is to consider and take action on the 2023 HAZMAT agreement with Columbia County. Um, it's an annual agreement with the county that uh, they provide HAZMAT coverage for 2023. Um, pretty cut and dried. Uh, anyone have any questions on this one? So if not, I am looking for a motion to approve the 2023 HAZMAT agreement with Columbia County. Alder Albright can make a motion to approve the 2023 HAZMAT agreement with Columbia County. Alder Gray seconds. 
So it's been moved and seconded that we approve the agreement. Is there any discussion? And we will do a roll call on this one as well. Motif? Aye. Reed? Aye. Steiner? Aye. Albright? Aye. Great. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, item number six is to consider and take action on the Oak Cultural Center Corporation request for the designated account. And um, we got some information on <coughs> this item from Attorney Johnson, and I, I wonder if you want to just give us a quick summation. I knew you were going to be out of the <laughs> Can you do it from there? Well, I guess you can't do it from there, can you? Oh, yeah, you have a microphone. You have a microphone you, right there. Does it work? Sure. <clears throat> Why not? Hey, look at that. No, that one doesn't. Yes, sir. Hey, look at there that. You go. All right. Save me a hassle. <laughs> okay. Um, before you is a resolution to create the restricted account as you discussed at the committee of the whole uh, last uh, meeting um, as I sat down and tried and started drafting the resolution I got hung up on a whole bunch of collateral issues that go along with trying to create that uh, create an account along the lines of what you were discussing so what you have in front of you is a resolution that creates a restricted account with zero strings attached and with complete control of any monies that come into that account to be used by the city when the city decides to, except for the fact that they are earmarked and designated for the auditorium project. Um, I, I started to get bogged down on what happens if this project fails and there's money that needs to be returned. Is this an interest-bearing account or not interest-bearing account? Um, what are the parameters of releasing the money because the council is going to have to uh, approve any release of the funds anyway? And then probably the biggest thing that caused me concern is it used to be a very difficult process for a nonprofit organization to become a 501c3 tax exempt organization. It's not hard anymore. Uh, it's about a $500 project. It takes two or three hours and about a month for the IRS to turn it around, but it's actually a very simple uh, process now. And if the uh, Oak Cultural Center is really interested in controlling its own funds, that would be the logical way for them to go forward. Um, the last thing that bothered me is that it's probably not a good practice for the city to open up its accounting system for others to do this as well. So once we start with one, we're going to have, we may have several. And this is a, I, I clearly believe it's a worthy project, and I clearly believe that because it's in a city building, um, it, it's worth doing this. But I just felt a little uncomfortable going any further than where I did. Up to you if you'd like me to go further. And um, my understanding is that if for whatever reason the money is collected and then they cannot carry through with the project, the money will go to the Mary Poser Fund, is that correct? Oh, that was our intention. As, as, as drafted, the money's going nowhere. Oh. You, you can make that decision if and when the time comes. When the time comes, okay. Right. And, and I bring that up because I just, I think there were some issues with that, you know, years ago when right. money was collected and no one seems to know where it went. Um, so that's not gonna be a concern this time around. Um, okay, thank you. A a anybody have any questions for Paul? Yes. Looks like you do. Um, I strongly support the project in general. I would really like to see the auditorium restored. However, um, I am not comfortable with the process that's being presented. I feel like we're doing pass-through accounting, which is highly frowned upon. Um, I open 501c3s on a regular basis for clients. It's very easy to do. I think if the interest is there, I would rather see Oak um, finish their 501c3 status and pursue it through their own 501. Okay, thank you. Adam? Or yeah, I just want to reiterate that I, I agree with Paul and Sarah that I, I, I would love to see the project done. I would love to see this building restored to its former glory. We already have an account with the CHLPC that is supposed to do just that. 
it's been sitting there for a long time. Not much is done because this is a very big project. I don't think the city should be taking on a liability of donations, which is essentially just going to be general fund tax just sitting there. If it sits there for too long, a new council, a new administration can do whatever they want with it, and that's just wasted dollars on the donation part. It's, it's a big liability, and I think it's very reckless for a city to actually start taking part in that when we have commissions like the CHLPC that monitor and check that balance. So I'm, I'm just opposed to opening the account systems up to these companies and donations like that. Thank you. Alder Reed? Oh, thank you. Uh, while I'm <clears throat> super interested in the project in general, and I mean desperately interested in having a functional theater, I really just don't think we're ready to okay this. I would like to table for further information and further consideration. Okay. Um. Oh, Kyle, sorry. Um, so uh, I believe th uh, there was a clarification that uh, Helen had pointed out to me. The Oaks Cultural Center um, is intending to operate as a uh, either a non-stock corporation. They have no intent, I believe, to operate as a nonprofit. Their intent would be that the city uses nonprofit funds to improve the auditorium the operation of the auditorium through some sort of MOU like we've had with several organizations that have not panned out to actually operate it would be a for-profit venture to bring performances and things like that to generate revenue to put back into the venue, uh, not on a necessarily nonprofit. Uh, but Helen's here that she could probably provide more. Um, the one thing I'll say is that the, the auditorium has been here for decades. And we've had money for quite a while at HLPC, and they've done a lot of worthwhile projects, but the auditorium has not been the recipient of any uh, notable improvements. So um, it could be that there's so many uh, improvements to be done throughout the community that the auditorium just isn't one that you know has gotten the attention it deserves, uh, but certainly one that is very valuable. Can I ask Attorney Johnson a quick question? Isn't that the definition of, of pass-through accounting? And the IRS frowns upon that. Um, I will defer on my accounting to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, but the comment that I, that I will make is, is that O Cultural Center can, set, can create itself as a non-stock corporation, does not have to be non-stock, non-profit, can be. Um, and also could create a separate 501c3 organization that is a non-stock, non-profit 501c3 entity. Again, it's a simple, well, it's, it's not simple. It, it's a filing that takes a few hours and could be completely separate of its original, uh, of, of the entity that it already has uh, set up right now. Uh, Alder Gray? So there's... I, I think a lot of this we're kind of going over and beyond what the actual intention is. So first of all, this is a city property. So the immediate like disagreement of the city holding funds for a city property is, I mean, in my opinion, a little silly to begin with. Second of all, this directly benefits the city. This isn't a benefit to the Oaks. This isn't a benefit to anyone. This is a benefit to the city. They are trying to raise funds so that we can understand exactly what's going on and exactly what needs to happen and how for it to be fixed. Once those funds are raised, that's what they would be spent on and nothing more. That's all this account is for. It's not for future donations or anything else. It's to raise money to figure out how we need to attack this problem. And it's a large problem. It's, and it's being exacerbated by the fact that our roof is failing above it and it's deteriorating quickly. The, one of the main driving forces of the city holding these funds is the Oaks is far from the first organization that has attempted to do something of this nature. And one of the big problems in the past is they have always fallen short of their financial goals and have never been able to actually accomplish anything substantive. One of the problems with that is everyone in Columbus that's been here for a while either knows of these <coughs> previous organizations, and many of us have given our personal funds to them for them to go absolutely nowhere. 
if it's sitting in a city account, we know where the funds are, and they're not going to just disappear. This is, it, it makes sense. It's city property. It makes sense for the city to hold the funds. My only problem with this resolution is I don't believe it is what the council requested it to be. The council requested the resolution to detail that the city would hold those funds for up to two years or when enough funds were available for this project to go underway. There is no time limit in this resolution. The other portion of this resolution was that the city was to make a new account for it to be held in, and if it wasn't to happen within that allotted time period, that those funds would automatically go into the Mary Poser Fund, which is, as before mentioned, under the control of the CHLPC. It would automatically go there. And that is part of the reason behind this, is that way everyone that's donating understands that these funds aren't just going to disappear. They're going to go back to the Mary Poser Fund for future use toward the same project. It's... It, yes, a 5013C is extravagantly easy to make nowadays, and it is only about 500 bucks to do so. But that doesn't take away the risk or the perception of people who would potentially donate to this organization. It being with the city and held by the city does that, and it makes it much more viable for the project to move forward. This is a project that I think every single person in this room wants to move forward, and this is a viable way for it to actually happen this time instead of it failing like it did every other time before. That's my two cents. So do you see some necessary tweaks to the resolution? I believe we need to change this resolution. I do not believe this is the resolution that was the will of the council and that was agreed on um, by Helen. I, I agree. I mean, because it, it's not any, it's really not anything we talked about. I do have a quick qu question, though. Kyle, is there, is there any way that we can get the HLPC involved in this? And, and, and I, just so that we have, <laughs> and I saw that Ruth held her hand up, so I... So HLPC, um, uh, Ian is the, the liaison, so I, I think he can obviously, uh, they're meeting tomorrow, I believe. Okay. Um, uh, and I don't know, he can maybe have a conversation to see if they can prioritize that during one of their agendas. Uh, but they are a commission and, and have their own independent authority. Right. Um, and, you know, I think we've had some conversations and emails, too, about there is a limited donation pool that we're always pulling mm -hmm. from. And, and so, you know, with the current projects they have going on, that limits the amount of money available for other things. So it, it's a priority, but it's on a list of priorities. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just think that it would be nicer if the right and the left hand knew what was going on. So, okay. Does it seem like we're moving towards tabling this? Uh, I, I think we need to at least um, redo this resolution before we do anything. So I think, unfortunately, it does need to be tabled until our next regular meeting, in my opinion, so we can redo this. I think during that time, um, like Kyle mentioned, CHLPC meets tomorrow. I will personally be there. I would love for you to go as well, Helen. Um, I think they would be a great partner, whether or not directly involved, at least partnering with them. I mean, Ruth and the rest of the CHLPC are incredible at fundraising, and this is right up their alley. So I, I think they would be a huge asset to you more than anything. Um, and that could help some of our problems if a city commission was involved. We can't tell them to be, though, on council. They are independent. But I, I think that is a great idea, and I don't, I personally, as their liaison, don't think there are very many people on the CHLPC that would be against doing something with our auditorium. So that's a... Uh, so is the... Well, does anyone else want to chime in? Okay. So is the proper procedure then to look for a motion to table the motion? Okay. If oh. that's what... <laughs> Council wants. Uh, <laughs> Reed moves to table the request for the Oak Cultural Center Corporation discussion. For Alder later. Albright can second that. So it's been moved and seconded that we table tonight's um, a action on the Oak Cultural Center Corporation. Is there any more discussion on this? Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Nay. Oh, okay. Motion passes. We will table it till our next meeting. And <clears throat> we are now down at number nine on tonight's agenda, which is to 
consider and take action on claims in the amount of seven hundred and ninety seven thousand dollars nine sorry seven hundred and ninety seven thousand one hundred and seventy four dollars and forty five cents so I am looking for a motion to approve the claims Alder Gray moves to approve the claims in the amount of seven hundred ninety seven thousand one hundred seventy four dollars and forty five cents Alder Steiner can second. So it's been moved and seconded that we approve the, the uh, claims for tonight in the amount specified. Is there any discussion? So we'll do a roll call on this. Reed? Aye. Steiner? Aye. Albright? Aye. Gray? Aye. Morton? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, and <clears throat> the last item on the agenda for this part of tonight's meeting is the report of city officers. So city administrator Kyle Ellison will go first. All right, thank you. Um, absentee voted has starting uh, or has started uh, so that's available the rest of this week and next week uh, from 8 to 4 30 uh, next Friday they'll be open till 5 o'clock for voting uh, reminder that if you received your absentee ballot in the mail you can return it to City Hall uh, but you can only return your own ballot uh, and you can't place the ballot in the drop box at the front of City Hall you actually have to turn it into the clerk otherwise it will not count uh, last night the CDA met and uh, they awarded a storefront awning grant uh, for 128 West James Street where the workshop is located uh, so we'll see some additional improvements coming downtown uh, I did want to point out though that that uh, that's a small grant program that's available to uh, pretty much every commercial and light industrial property in the city of Columbus uh, so those improvements can be for their facade signage or awnings and then uh, anyone who's interested can reach out to me at City Hall to get more details on that uh, just today we took delivery of our new Ford mini dump pickup today at uh, DPW uh, we still have to get it uh, decaled and things like that and a little bit of equipment put on uh, but that's replacing our 1994 vehicle uh, old Smokey uh, so uh, that's a major replacement for our fleet uh, long time coming uh, we'll be moving the old vehicle through the other departments to see if anyone really wants to take it uh, with the vehicle or the asset disposal policy but my guess is that that one will probably be moving out and we'll be selling that one um, a couple exciting things that uh, we have a new DPW employee starting on Monday and as a bonus he's also a member of the fire department so that's a great hire on a couple different levels and I also wanted to mention that one of our longtime employees that just retired at the end of last year uh, came back and asked if he could help out on a part-time basis. So we've taken him up on that, and he's been bouncing around in the plow trucks. And uh, we're just grateful to have him back, and he's happy to be back. So uh, just uh, good to see Tim back and, and uh, good to be back on the team. And then just this afternoon, uh, Pat was really excited that we received a signed acceptance letter for our new deputy clerk. Oh, uh, so we expect to have her join us partway through April. And uh, so the positions are starting to fall in place. So uh, lots of good news. Great. <clears throat> thank you so much. Um, I want to uh, thank the many staff, uh, city staff members and workers who pulled together to assist the Columbus Cares and Re Rehabilitation Center last, I believe it was last Friday, um, Thursday or Friday, uh, when a fire broke out. Um, it could have been a very dangerous, difficult situation. It was dealt with very quickly and efficiently by the Columbus Fire Department, by the Police Department, the uh, Columbus Utility helped out, DPW, um, and the Emergency Management Department. Everybody pitched in to move the residents out to safety and I also want to uh, sincerely thank the Zion Lutheran Church and school because they allowed all the residents to come across the street and stay with them until it was safe for them to go back uh, this was a, a really good example I think of how everybody in the city pulls together to to help the com uh, community and I really thank everyone who participated it was uh, a great relief that everything turned out okay um, <clears throat> the rec department would like you to know that you have until April 1st, which is coming up sooner than you think, uh, to apply for employment at the pool. They need lifeguards and, and other staff there. The Easter egg hunt is coming up uh, Saturday, April 8th, and Amy Jo's looking for volunteers to help out with that. Um, between the hours of uh, 11 a.m. and 5 p.m., you can work summer, all of them. Just give her a call, and she will put you to work. Uh, one of the best parts of mayor being mayor, I just want to let you guys know this is the opportunity to meet with 
community members and different groups. And in January, I was invited by Girl Scout Troop 8001 to come and talk about um, being a mayor and uh, what it means and community service. And they just, they sent me a little card and they also gave me a framed picture, which I was gonna bring tonight and I just didn't get around to doing it, of me with the kids. So this is a shout out to those Girl Scouts in Troop 8001, quite a group, and I'm sure they're on their road to bigger and better things. Um, I wanna remind everybody that our next council meeting is gonna take place on Monday night, April 3rd, because the next day is the election for, for uh, for the spring elections. Um, there still is a vacancy on the Tourism Commission for anybody who may be interested in that. And uh, that's it for me. And so now I am looking for a motion to adjourn this part of our meeting. Alder Gray moves to adjourn. M motive seconds. It's been moved and seconded that we adjourn. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. All right. So I have, let's see, it is 7.45. And like I mentioned, our next meeting is where we will be discussing um, city-owned properties in much greater detail. So that's, I'm sure, the meeting that all of you actually want to be here for instead of all of that fun official city business that you just <laughs> witnessed. Isn't that after you close in the property by about four hours? You close that afternoon and then you have the meeting that evening? Uh, I am not exactly certain what you're getting at, Mr. Rhodes, but no, it's not true. But at any rate, I will, let's take about 10 minutes. We had a much longer than normal um, first meeting and meet back at five to eight and we'll get started with the committee of the whole.
Okay, everybody. All right, good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. If you could sit down, we'd like to get started. All right, I have 7.55. Today is March 21st. I'd like to welcome you all to the Columbus Common Council Committee of the Whole. Um, with that, if uh, our clerk, Pat Gable, could take a roll call, please. All right, present. Arnold? Present. Gray? Present. Motive? Present. Reed? Here. Rokey is excused. Steiner? Here. Thank you. And this note meeting was properly noticed. So next up on the agenda is to approve the agenda. I just have one alteration. Um, unfortunately, uh, Paula Steiner. Actually, the, she's coming. <laughs> oh, will she be here? Um, all right. Well, I would like, how long do you think? She just come in town. She's gonna drop and <laughs> <laughs> All right. So she'll be here. So I won't remove that. I'll take. Uh, I'll take a motion. Modif will make a motion to approve tonight's agenda. I'll second. I have a motion from Alder Modif and a second from Mayor Arnold. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Agenda is approved. Um, next up on the agenda is citizen comments. Was there anyone that wanted to comment during this meeting? We already collected the thing, so if you wanted to comment, just go ahead, Helen. Hi, guys. Again. <laughs> uh, just push the... Oh. Um, Perfect. Nice. Okay, I got it. We're on, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm Helen Clark, 649 West Narrow Street. I would like to clear up a few misconceptions that I heard in our previous meeting, um, just so we have it all fresh in our mind. Um, so, the Oak Cultural Center is a non-stock corporation because we're not going to have stock, right? Um, and it is very simple to fill out the form. It's right online. It's fillable. I think it's about $600 to send in, and it's all filled out and in a folder. It was created about two, it's dated like two weeks after I actually created the Oaks Cultural Center, and that was just so I can put the cart, you know, back behind the horse, get my board members all figured out because you need to list that on the, on the form as well. But one of the major pieces of sending that in to me was, is this reasonable for me to do right now? And part of that research was to go around and talk to people in the community. So I talked to probably about 30 people on this subject. And all of them were like, yeah, good luck. Like I said the last time, nobody's going to give you the money because people have given money in the past and God knows where it's went, probably bought so-and-so a new car. Okay, so like, I'm like, wow, that this is going to be more of a struggle than I had expected. So what I started to think of then, because I still do really want to get this done, is you know think of what would make me feel comfortable. I'm pretty frugal with my money. Okay, I'm, would I feel comfortable knowing that some random person spent 30 minutes, $120, to make a Oaks Cultural Center Corporation? And you know, I mean, it's simple. It honestly is $120 in 30 minutes, and you get an FEIN number. It's real quick to make that up. Okay, so anybody could do it. Okay, and then to turn in the 501c3, you know, like attorney said, it's super simple. You just fill out a fillable PDF form and you send it in with a check for $600 and then you can get all the money you want. You know, as long as you have a good reason, people will give it to you, right? Okay, so anybody could legitimately do what we're going to be doing. Is it trustworthy? Maybe not. Okay, people that I would be asking don't know my values or my morals. They don't know if it's actually going to go to where I say it's going to go. You know, there's plenty of nonprofits that had similar issues, right? So what I was thinking of is then maybe going to an attorney and having them set up a trust fund. Okay, then I thought maybe I would feel more secure in that than just giving it to a random person to do what I think they're going to say they do. But then I was like, well, then, then there's a concern of disbursement agreement. You know, how do they know the disbursement agreement that I have set up with that trust fund? Again, it could be anything. Right? So they're not. I wouldn't necessarily feel that comfortable with that. But Amy Jo, I'm going to use your name because I thought of you. But would I feel comfortable if Amy Jo came to me and said, Helen, we need $1,500 to do the Easter egg hunt or it's not going to happen? I would feel comfortable giving Amy Jo $1,500 because I know that she's going to take it. She's going to put it in the city's <laughs> recreation fund. And 
she's going to make sure that those kids have that egg hunt, right? So there's two things involved there, security of funds and security of progress. So what I'm asking for is I do not want control of this money because that security is then taken down. People need to feel comfortable that this is a city money. It's going to go in a city fund. I'm not going to be lying in my pockets with it. Okay, they need to know that. And this is a way that they'll know that. Okay, but then there's also the portion of security of progress, which was also an issue with the past. How are people going to know that if they give me $1,500, that it's actually going to go to fix the, the auditorium? Like, how do they know that? So I want to be that piece. That's where the Oak Cultural Center is going to play its part. I want to be the piece that will secure the progress. I want you to be the piece that secures the funds. And I think that's all I had to say. Awesome. Thank you so much, Helen. Oh, okay, thanks. Was there anyone else that wanted? Go ahead, Ruth. It's off again. <laughs> I'm so good. I'm so mechanical. <laughs> the face was somber. You sent me out of it. There you go. There. It's on. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm Ruth Hermanson. I'm speaking on behalf of CHLPC. Just a quick, um, Helen, this is almost sort of the first I've heard of this. I welcome you to come to our meeting. This is what we do. Um, the funds that were previously raised is in a special fund earmarked for this. It is a city-owned building. It's quite a process to go through. Um, like Ian mentioned, the city hall needs some structural work back in 1992. That elevator was put in by Mary Poser and HLPC at the time, working with the city, true connection, to make access to the upstairs. There's engineering that needs to be done. The city hall itself, the main body, has to be done. Um, there's been no misuse of any funds. They're in a fund earmarked for this. And we have completed several projects raised the money and completed the projects such as the pavilion we are now in the middle of the rest haven and our next project but i don't want to disclose it because we haven't come to city council to ask their permission so there's a whole um list criteria we have to follow so we welcome you to come to our meeting hear more about us. Um, we've been around for a long time, I think since 1983. We were started when they tore down the building at the top of the hill where there's a painting of it in City Hall. So um, somehow this commission arised and um, we're the caretakers, so to speak. We welcome your energy, energy and everything like that. Um, and we could use some help. We can have volunteers. So please come to the meeting tomorrow at 4 p.m. Thank you. Thank Any other questions I can clear up? Uh, not right now, but thank you so much, Ruth. I appreciate it. Uh, anybody else that wanted to speak before we move on? All right, seeing none. Then next up on the agenda is the department reports. In your packets, you will see reports from the DPW, the fire station, library, police uh, department, the treasurer, and the wastewater treatment facility. Any questions, comments, or concerns on any of those? All right, seeing none, moving right along. Uh, next up is Paula Steiner made it here with us tonight. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good thing the first meeting went a little long for us. Yes, I was actually watching it from the emergency room. So I appreciate all the, the longevity with that previous meeting so I could attend tonight. Um, Is your daughter Paula, doing okay? Um, she... She's 10. She will find her next She'll thing. She'll bounce back um, half we, we, we thought she potentially fractured her elbow, and with her being a figure skater, we just wanted to make sure it was addressed immediately. So um, I had, like, this fabulous idea to, like, have all these beautiful pictures and everything to show you guys, but life got in the way, so I'd like to apologize about that. Um, but there are two things that I wanted to update you in regards to the beautification. The biggest thing is just kind of how we're operating as a group. We've met our, because we were January, February, and then March. So we had our third meeting. It went out, it went along beautifully. I think everyone's just kind of jiving and trying to get to know each other and figuring out what's important to each person. Because we all may have these grandiose ideas, but we need to be able to work together as a team. So with that being said, two big things that came out that are currently in the works are the downtown flowers, which 
were started about three or four years ago. Um, this year, we are actually, um, with the help of Amy, um, Amy Bos Boswell, say, I always, but uh, Amy, <laughs> everyone knows Amy, um, she is actually going to handle purchasing and um, essentially planning the ones that are going to be hanging over, which will be great. Um, we did order some hanging baskets from Boy Scouts to put in the urns on the outside area. And then I spoke with Robin from Secret Garden today, and she is actually going to take care of the flower pots outside forward as well as cardinal embroidery. So all of the downtown will have flowers and we will we will be awesome. Um, the second part is, and this was brought up the last time we had beautification, I think Trina might recall the discussion of murals. Um, this group wants to move full, he full steam ahead when it comes to murals um, under the dire direction of um, Phil from DPW, he actually recommended a perfect spot, which would, our first perfect spot, which would be just as you head out in the courtyard next to the senior center. It will always be the senior center. So sorry, Mary, if you didn't correct me. <laughs> um, so that is really our goal for the first one because we thought that with wanting to have the businesses involved and have them on their buildings, we wanted to show that the city is going to put some skin in the game and do something with their building. One of the things that I need your guys' okay or something if you want to ponder, because, you know, it's been a long night already, is um, Amy Sandow came up with the idea of using the images that are in the halls of City Hall that were painted by Susan Stair. Um, and from our understanding, they were gifted to the city, and they need to have council's approval if we decide to replicate them on any additional buildings. So... Do you guys have any feelings about that? Thank you very much, Paula. I mean, I think it's a great first mural as long as we can legally do it. If, as long as there's no problems with it, I think it's a good place to start. I think it'll be good, and it's a good way to start putting old pictures of Columbus on, on our walls to right. celebrate the history, which is a big part yeah. of Columbus. <laughs> And it's, I think, entirely appropriate for this courtyard. You know, yeah. other areas in town, I think there's better choices. But I think for this courtyard specifically, it's a good choice. Do you guys know the images? I mean, cause, okay. I just, I have them on my phone. I, <laughs> I had intended on providing something for you guys. but And you're talking about the pictures right outside here, right? Yeah, so of there are... There's at least four over here, mm -hmm. and depending on how you wanted to work it, there were some smaller images of, like, the older fountain that used to sit in front of City Hall, and then as well as the water tower. And speaking of the older fountain, there is a member uh, in our group that would like to see that come back as well. So more to yeah. come. Awesome. Thank you. Any so, other questions or comments? So, Ian, awesome. not to be super direct, but do we have your blessing to proceed with murals from... I mean, my blessing, yes. <laughs> um, how does the council feel about putting a, um, the first of the murals going outside here on the community center? Are in you our... putting it on the parking lot side or the city hall side? The city, the city hall, hall side, because per Phil from DPW, he stated that the trees don't grow on that side, so we wouldn't be missing out on any of that type of nature because they just don't grow. Alderine? Oh, um, I do want to look at the proposed mural ideas first. Um, I really... <laughs> I got you. <laughs> I know. Uh, I, I really like the idea. I just want to make sure that um, we are not damaging the brickwork. Right. That's just yeah. my well, main in this, concern. In this building, this building is just concrete. It's cinder block, so there's no need to damage. In the future, one of the things, I'm the liaison for the beautification group, um, one of the things that they discussed were on the buildings where it could damage it, we would have giant frames and murals that you would put into it, so that way we didn't paint directly on the buildings. I'd like to request that the beautification committee come back with a more formal proposal with pictures and and when they know the cost and, and that kind of stuff, okay. and we can go from there. So I, I totally respect and understand where you're coming from, but in order to get buy-in from the community, we need to be um, 
people are visual individuals. So if we can't say we're going to put this image here, they're going to go, why am I going to pay you anything if I don't know what's going up right. there? So I think one thing to clarify is this is intended to be um, from donations. This isn't yes. city funds that yes. we're spending. So I think that might be part of Alder Motive's hesitation is the we're, city yeah, isn't we, spending money we, on this. And, Unification And when we started this group fundraise. and when I came to you guys initially to start this group, I told you guys flat out I didn't want any city money because we knew that this needed to be a donation base because, as Kyle will tell you, the city doesn't have any money. So... <laughs> <laughs> Right, yeah. and and thankfully the beautification committee did just receive funds to it. So there there are funds in the beautification. There is uh, six thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars that was raised previously in combination with the Chamber of Commerce and the Columbus Downtown Development Corporation. Yes, I got the email from the group because I've been a little difficult with them. <laughs> well, thankfully you were because it finally came through, so yes. I appreciate that. So um, Amy had found out from Ann Donahue that those are in your ownership. So would you guys like me to come back to check that information, or what would you like to do proceeding? Um, there was no legal hang-up on, like, we can replicate those, looking at Paul and Kyle? No reason that we can't uh, somebody was going to check that but it wasn't me <laughs> yeah like owning the paintings and <laughs> owning the right yeah. <laughs> I'd, I'd be happy to check it if you would like me to but uh I, somebody i haven't yet going yeah. to check with um well i know susan stairs niece maybe or granddaughter uh, nina th do you that, know nina so that was Oh, I didn't know that that was her granddaughter. Um, uh, I, I, she's a relation somehow. Oh, yeah, yeah. I Because when Amy had initially brought it up, that was my biggest concern is if there were any stair relatives in the community that we respect their wishes. But when Amy had reached out to Anne during our meeting, she said that those were gifted to, to okay. the city hall to do with what they please. So we would just need city council approval to be able to proceed with replicating them. So you probably don't need to contact anybody in the family then? If I mean, owning is so a gift of a painting and the legal rights to replicating a painting are two different things. Mm. So that doesn't necessarily. So it sounds mean like anything. you're going to get tagged on this one. Paul. So um, <laughs> all, all I'm saying is we have to cross our T's and dot our I's, make sure we have the rights to replicate it. Otherwise, we'll just have to come up with a different mural. But um, how, do, pending approval that we can replicate those paintings, how does council feel about that being the first mural? I think that and sounds great. Which one were you actually? Which picture were you looking at? Well, I had a couple in mind, but this is probably the one that. Yeah, she's she's not cooperating today. Yeah, I like that one. And if if Town Tab would be willing, oh, I love that photo. Yeah. I would prefer that over there, but I think Town Tab would be more appropriate. <coughs> Any so does what's the will of the council? Are we okay allowing the go ahead for the beautification committee to start more? actively going and looking forward to the mural and let, let me taking be steps aggressive. to move forward, right? Raising funds and making it happen, pending that we can do that. Otherwise, Paula will be back before us <laughs> with a different idea for a mural. I, I think maybe one of the things that I, I think is important about Susan Stair is that, you know, she grew up here and she's a, a big part of the history of Columbus mm -hmm. and yeah, lived in the stair mansion and um really loved columbus so i think it's in my opinion it's very fitting that you're picking her as, as hey, th her work was, mm -hmm. that was all amy's idea and yeah. she just hit it out of the park yeah. so yeah. yeah all right perfect i think we have a consensus that everything is good to go as long as we can legally replicate the images so will you guys let me know or do you want me to i i i think it's probably more of a you thing sorry paul <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Paula. Awesome. Thank you. Unless there was any other questions for Paula? No. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. Then next up on the agenda is to discuss the, RF, the RFP discussion for city-owned properties. Um, before we get there, I prepped a little bit of a um, statement for everyone. Um, so as 
just to clarify, we are now talking about city-owned properties, which include the dingy property, as well as um, the Ford, old Ford store, um, Olivet, the Bond Tower Drive, all of those properties. Um, so there have been a lot of discussions, many stemming from misinformation about the land the city has purchased and or sold recently. I understand some of our citizens are concerned about potential uses, the protocol in which the council followed to acquire them, and whether or not the city should even be involved in such acquisitions or sales. It's understandable for there to be some reservations given the need for confidentiality in real estate transactions, as well as the lack of progress the city has made in the past. And I fully respect the fact that a lot of you do have those reservations and questions, and I would expect nothing else. I would like to give a little bit of background to help answer some of these questions. Um, so the big thing is our city has needs, of course. Uh, one of the primary one is housing and increasing our tax base, to say it very simply. But we also have resources and opportunities. The city must be thoughtful to progress and maximize our opportunities while preserving our unique history and minimizing the resources spent in doing so. In 2018, the Roadmap 2050 project started. It evaluated city um, facilities and resources versus the needs in order to come up with a plan for upgrades and replacements of the critical facilities within our city. But before we talk more about the 2050 plan and the comprehensive plan, things of that nature, I think the biggest thing is we have to talk about the um, more of, well, what's the best word for that? I had a good word for it because I wrote it all down, but I'm bad at even following my own notes. Um, is we have to look at the limitations of it. So the big thing is the entire 2050 plan, it relies on a 3% annual growth within the city of Columbus. And it's not just a 3% annual growth. That 3% annual growth only goes to fund the historically high debt that the 2050 plan puts us in. It would put us in the highest level of debt that Columbus has ever seen. It would match the record levels of debt that Columbus has had in the past. And the only way we could pay for that debt is if we grow 3% annually. Or there are a few other options, but you'd like those even less. Now, the 3% doesn't sound like a lot, right? It's pretty small growth. Columbus, over the past decade, grew 1.3% historically. And in the past several years, we haven't even grown a percentage. So we are nowhere near the 3% growth needed to maintain what our plan is, let alone even maintain our services that we're offering currently. We are in a very real situation here. And I understand that the dingy property is near and dear to many. Uh, Historic preservation is near and dear to myself. I live in one of the historic homes in our city. I am the liaison on the CHLPC. I very much respect the, historic, the history of our community. But at the same time, there is a need for growth. I'm getting off track on what I wrote. Um, so to achieve this goal, the city requires sustained growth a reduction of the high percentage of land that's within the city that is either assessed agriculturally or currently underdeveloped and just sitting there, not necessarily owned by the city. A shift in funding, which, I mean, if you read between the lines there, that's increasing your taxes. Or a shift in the services the city currently provides, which means cutting services. This is the reality of our situation. Columbus also adopted a, com a comprehensive plan, which is a guide to the physical, social, and economic development of the city. The goals for housing in it, and I quote, are to provide a variety of housing types to meet existing housing needs and encourage future growth. 
The objectives to meet said goal are one, to create an attractive and safe neighborhoods that reinforce the existing architectural character of the city and provide a stable tax base. Two, create mixed neighborhoods that provide a range of housing types, densities, and costs. Three, ensure the residential developments are built and maintained according to levels deemed safe by industry standards. The reality is that on our current trajectory, we aren't even reaching the 1.3% growth rate that Columbus has had historically, let alone the 3% growth rate that is required to meet our goals and pay the historic level of debt that the 2050 plan would put us into. Now, couple that with the rising cost of goods, services, and labors, it gets even more bleak. It, I don't have to tell all of you how incredibly harsh the um, inflation is right now. It's not just felt by us as individuals, it's felt by the city. Now, looking at it from a perspective of local businesses, it's becoming increasingly difficult for them to grow or even maintain their workforce without bringing on potential new workers into the community with no place for them to live. As consumers, our businesses, many of them, rely largely on the local population. Limiting residents and housing severely impacts their ability to remain viable, let alone grow in the future. We are at a crossroads in Columbus. We either start to grow and maintain or we start shrinking. I don't want to see our library go away. I want our parks and recs. Uh, Amy Jo does an amazing job. I want to keep everything that she does. I want Columbus to have more. I don't want you to have less. And that is the alternative to developing things like the dingy property, as well as multiple other properties. Um, with that, I'm going to get off my soapbox. I would like, but my intention for this discussion is not just dingy, but also Tower Drive and um, the Ford store. I think it's time that the city starts moving forward on multiple properties. Um, so a little bit of history on why we own these properties, because not all of you may know. Um, so the Ford store was originally purchased um, oh, quite some time ago as a potential location for the fire department. Nothing has been done with it since. It's kind of just been sitting there um, for multiple reasons. One of the big things that need to happen, in my opinion, and also in the opinion of the 2050 plan before we do a fire station is to create a rural fire district and zero progress on that has been made. Um, so what that would do um, for a little bit of background for people that don't understand that is a fire district right now, uh, the city of Columbus, all of us as taxpayers pay 100% for the fires for our facilities for in the fire department. Whereas our rural fire agreement, we, they do pay for 50% of the fire trucks. But they, of course, would benefit from a new fire station just as much as we would because they receive the same services from them just like we would. The only way to, for them to pay their fair share is through a, a fire district in establishing that. In my opinion, I think it's incredibly important we do that before we create a fire station. Um, my other humble opinion on the Ford store as a location for the fire station is I believe it, while it was a great purchase when they purchased it and potentially the best location available at the time because there's very few places to purchase in Columbus ever, it's not the best location for a fire station um, for multiple reasons. One, it's not its highest and best <coughs> use. It's an expensive piece of commercial property. So it already increases the cost of a fire station exponentially just because of the cost of the land that it's sitting on. Um, two, if there were ever a disaster at one of the facilities across the street, um, one of the manufacturing facilities that store hazardous chemicals and many other things, that location would be in an inclusion zone. Do you want your fire station in an inclusion zone during an emergency? doesn't make sense. It's just not the best property. So in my opinion, going forward on the RFPs, I would like to maintain an option for the fire station 
in my opinion, the um, land on Tower Drive is the best that the city currently owns for a fire station location. And I would like to look into going to RFP on both the Dingy property and the Ford store. With that, I'll open it up. Go ahead. Uh, I disagree with Tower Drive, and I'll tell you why. Because the residents over there, they're not going to be happy. Mm -hmm. I agree with you as far as the rural fire district, but you know, part of that would be, you know, does the rural area have any land that they could donate to it? That could be part of it too. I, I mean, just because that's what happens. I I also don't think that Olivet is necessarily the ideal location. I think it's right. better than the Ford store, and I think we should keep a location open right. until we have a better one. Right. Um, but otherwise, I appreciate everything you had to say. I mean, because I agree with you, obviously, with everything that you said. Um, I, I would like for us to start moving on stuff, too. Thank you. Oh, go ahead, Alderee. Well, thank you. Um, where to start? Um, I, I guess I'll start with this is a very important conversation, and we should have had it months ago. It's beyond twisted that it's happening right now. I, I don't know how else to put it. <clears throat> to keep going, um, as far as the need for growth, I very much understand it. I want to see new places for new residents that will increase business. I very much want that. Um, I think everyone wants that. But I, I don't want to see it at, at any cost. I mean, not at the cost of the soul of our city, per se. My goodness. I just think we made such a mistake in which property to choose for our development. I mean, at this point, if the city truly owns the dingy farm, I would like to resell it for a small profit and let it go. Thank you. Thank you, Alderine. Alder Steiner. Um, thank you, Ian, for everything you're saying. I, and I do agree that the situation has become rather dire. This city has been just stagnant, not going anywhere for far too long. And it's really starting to hit home with everything that we do, everything that needs to happen. We have roads that are in shambles, uh, stormwater problems that are coming up. And these are all incredibly expensive ventures. Yeah, we could have spent you know, money somewhere else that everyone's assuming is this, that, and the next thing. But a lot of that's one time deal and we're done. We need a constant flow of revenue mm -hmm. and we can't tax anymore. We're just stopped. This dingy property. Yeah. I don't want to lose the, the soul of the city. I want to keep the everything that we can, but some things are just the reality that we need to kickstart this forward. And this mm -hmm. wasn't the first thing that we've tried to do. No. We've ventured out and we've asked, we've tried to get things moving and everyone is just so concerned about the way the economy is right now that nothing's happening. We can't wait. It has to happen. It has to happen now or we will all fail and lose everything that we hold dear within the city. So I, I, I think this is a really good conversation to start doing and developing everything that we have is probably the most important thing we can do that, coming in the future right. for this council and the city itself. Thank you, Alder Steiner, and thank you for bringing up another point, is the Dingy property was not our first choice for development. There are a lot of areas that we would love to develop. There's no one that's willing to sell it. So the Dingy property is available. It is something that we can develop, and it needs, we need development. And part of development and part of the reason that we can't get any of these other lands is that the city doesn't have the best track record in actually moving forward and developing things. Once we actually have a project like the Dingy property and move forward and start developing it, the, we hopefully won't be so landlocked in the future. Hopefully it'll soften the resolve of the rest of the land that's sitting as agricultural use and things around our city so that they can see that the city is serious and wants to do these projects. Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, just a, a couple, you know, points on, uh, you know, starting at the countryside, then going to Tower and then mm. to Dingy. Um, uh, the countryside lot that remains, uh, the main building that uh, sits there now, um, uh, that is uh, 25,000 square feet. The 2050 plan uh, called for a 21,000 mm -hmm. square foot fire station. Um, 
Uh, so you, uh, you know, we're not precluded from still right. having that yep. be a fire station. You know, that that is not a dream that's unattainable, yep. um, and you know, barring the funding. Um, and, you know, looking at the five bugles design that they did for uh, Platteville just in 2021, they actually, you know, as you start in the conceptual phase, you start, you know, at 21,000. Uh, but then as you move into the schematic phase, they actually uh, recognize that you actually refine those numbers and often they actually come down. So the, the building might actually shrink from 21,000 when you actually put the pieces all together. So um, definitely still an option for a fire mm -hmm. station there. Um, it, when we compared the mileage and the times, uh, they were very similar between tower and uh, countryside. I think the uh, the times were about equal. The mileage was a little less uh, for all fire department employees right now. Um, so there would be a slight advantage for Tower Drive. Uh, Tower Drive, if you remember, we bought, I think, in November of 21, or we closed right in December. It was right about towards then, the end. Yeah. Um, uh, they had an existing agreement uh, with the dam farms and uh, the community garden, and so we entered into um, a farm lease because we didn't have a specific use that was ready to go in the ground immediately. We didn't want to uh, mow all of that or become a noxious weed site. Um, there was an investment of fertilizer and other chemicals that the, the farmer was going to be making. So we had an agreement that said we notify them by May 1st of 2022 if we're going to use it in 2023. It's a renewing contract, so we have till May 1st of this year to tell them if we want to use that property in 2024. So we have the next mm -hmm. month to figure that out. And if we think we're going to start doing something on that property, now is the time to be thinking about that and make that decision um, at the second meeting in April so we can provide the notifications. Right. Um, but that's one of the reasons that you know we are kind of not doing anything there is because we're under a lease agreement. Um, that did come off the tax roll. Um, uh, we were receiving $13.49 in tax revenue. Um, uh, we did get um, $795 in uh, farm lease payments. Um, agricultural land, which is nearly half yeah. of what we have in the city, pays almost nothing. Um, you, know, you look at the seven and a half acres that the dingy farm is, they pay about what uh, a single family property in, uh, in you know one of the newer subdivision pays because agricultural land is valued uh, much lower in Wisconsin. Um, so, uh, you know, taking the land off the tax roll is a concern, but relative to what you could actually you know get, um, yeah. you and know, it's I mean, uh, there's yeah, considerations. Long there. story short, we make more money owning it and renting and leasing it out than we did on the tax roll. Yeah. By so, hundreds of dollars. And so Tower Drive, uh, there's uh, a couple things you could do there. You could easily put, um, you could fit a public work site, you could fit a fire department site, you could also make it a residential site. Um, you know, I think combining those uh, would be, uh, any one of those would be possible. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think moving over to the dingy property, the beauty of an RFP process there is, it allows you to evaluate multiple options. Uh, you know, what if there's an opportunity to save the house and develop single family? Uh, what if it allows the, the couple that wants to buy the property to buy the property, come to the community, and you still get to do a certain amount of single family along the, you know, mm -hmm. one edge of the property towards Faith Lutheran? Um, you know, that there are possibilities to do that um, and still save the historic, you know, dingy farm, which, to my understanding, used to run out to Highway K right. and is now filled with homes. Right. Um, yeah, the vast majority of the dingy property was developed long ago. So, you know, the RFP process allows you to bring a lot of people to the table, look at a lot of different options, and then make a decision on what makes the most sense and how you fit the variety of needs, whether it's the fire station, the public works facility, mm -hmm. which the public works facility since May of 2016 has been in, a, in the floodway. If we get another flood, it's, it's done. We can't build back there. There is no I've other plan. I've personally gotten flooded out of that parking lot before during the rec meeting, actually, I think it was. So, <laughs> so the recommendation is not to build a fire station first. It's to you know, fix the, the public works situation first because when we need public works to fix our flooding, they're going to be trying to save their own facility, um, and we don't have a solution for that yet. 
Um, you know, I think as we look at it, there might be other options. Maybe you can build up some areas on River Road so that River Road might be more of an option for part of your public works mm -hmm. operation and you could shrink into you know two campuses or something but i think there's ways to look at it and having options on the table should help us come to you know the best assortment of uses and needs all matched up together right yeah and that's kind of where i'd like to go next is so those are our three main properties we own um, of course, the fire station was earmarked for the Ford store. It's still possible to go there. It's, you know, against what I think is the best location for a fire station, but that I'm only one person. The rest of council can decide that's still the best location. Um, so we have Tower Drive, we have Dingy, and we have the Ford store. So um, let's take them one at a time for how we want to move forward. Uh, the dingy property. Um, my recommendation would be to go to RFP on the dingy property um, so we can entertain from developers on different things. I would like to make sure when we go to RFP that they know there is a desire to save the home if possible so that they can come up with plans. Maybe developers can come up with a plan saving and not saving and give us different options of things of that nature. Um, also in that process I would like to make sure in my opinion, um, that we stay um, sympathetic to the properties around it. So behind that property, there is um, single family homes. So I want single family homes along the backside of the property. And I think moving forward is where we could get more of the multi-family or like townhouses or, you know, there could be a few different plans on that, but I think that's the most sympathetic in my opinion. Um, but what does the rest of council think? Nodding heads. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Okay, nodding heads. So RFP on the dingy property and any other notes that we should put forward in an RFP or thoughts? I, I would personally like to avoid apartments on that front side of the park because we have a apartment complex yep, going I in agree. and then one on the other side of the road. I agree. I'd like to keep it townhomes mm -hmm. or a way to do single dwelling condos so that we can bring um, starter right. families right. in. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I want to see some sort of like multi-family like townhomes, like a row of townhouses, quadplexes, yeah. duplexes, something of that nature, but own, not, right. not rentals. I think we have, so in Commerce Park, there's this spring, it'll be starting soon, there's new apartments going up. So I think that's a we're going to start filling the need for that over there. So I don't think we have that need in Dingy. I think Dingy should stay single family, but a mix of single family homes and more condo style. What, and I think we should leave that semi open to the developers right. of what they bring to us of the right. style. But, but I agree completely. I don't want to see any apartments there. Um, I would, if you can just put a note in there that, at least for me personally, I would like to save the house. So right. if we yeah. want to make that kind of, you know, an yeah, important factor. Yeah, that's, the, that's right. the big thing. I think we want yeah. them right. to know that we want them to come back with a plan that we, that could <clears throat> hopefully save the house. I echo that as well. I'd like to save the house if we can. And I don't know how much it would cost maybe even, because the hardest part of saving that house and in my mind is most likely going to be the location it sits on the property. I don't know how much, how expensive it might be to just, since you don't have to move it far, maybe we could just put it back a bit. I don't know. Cheaper to move it a little bit or far. Yeah, I don't know. So <laughs> those are not things I deal with typically, but I would like to save it somehow if possible. Any other thoughts on RFP on Dingy or anything that we should um, bring forward or... okay at least for now we'll take that to the next regular meeting before we go so it we at least have some a good direction for staff any more direction that you think you need for it for now right right the regular meeting I, I think we're good for a regular meeting on dingy okay good um, then next up is well in in my mind, it's hard to separate the Ford store and Olivet because in my mind, um, Tower Drive was, the pr when we purchased that, it was in my mind to purchase it as an alternative location to the fire station. It, 
that was kind of my driving force behind why I approved purchasing it, but that's not necessarily the will of the council. So that's what are you guys thinking? What would you like to see with Olivet and the Ford store? Well, I, I guess I'm, I'm going to have to agree with Shelley that when it was the word was out there that we might be using that land for a fire station, I did get a number of mm -hmm. calls from people who were concerned about it yeah. being in that particular spot. Um, I would like to see it developed. I know yeah. part of it is in a flood, so I know that there is, but so that can be made, made up for stormwater, right? The yep. part that's low. Uh, anything that's really in the floodplain isn't going to give you much stormwater control, yeah. but you can build in some features to, you know, soften the features of flooding and stuff like that. What I I was going to say, I would like to see that become residence as well on Tower Drive, and so that we have both Dingy and Tower. And then DPW might be more appropriate at the old Ford store. And then once we actually get to the point of the rural fire district, we can look for donated land or other land that might be available at that time. But it's going to take some time to get us to that point. It's not like we're building it tomorrow. And so you're saying not necessarily we don't necessarily have to keep in either of the two open for a fire station at not this time. right now no and if we if we do build a new fire station then that opens up that spot could tech potentially open up for dpw right kyle the old fire station uh, uh no i don't know uh, the, the old fire station they're saying you need six to eight acres um uh, so you're really looking for a large site uh, they need a lot of outdoor storage and parking DPW needs that money. yeah but oh, yeah. you could also you know depending on how you split up your uses you could potentially you know split some of that off um, uh, just two comments um, you know we're going to bring the RFP back on right. April 3rd for uh, wh whichever ones um, you're going to put it out for a month or whatever um, the next council is going to be evaluating these um, the, the whole point is to put a whole bunch of options in front of you. Right. Um, and the, there's going to be clear language that you can deny all of them, any of them. Um, so instead of deciding where the fire station DPW could go, we could take offers on all of them, and then the next and council can figure out decide which ones are best. which is the best combination of options, and then yeah. kind of settle on where they think city facilities would go on the alternatives. And, I, okay. and that's, all, that's also a... Uh, option or a thought I was thinking of too is we could potentially go to RFP on everything that we own and then pick and choose whether or not we want to do it. Um, talking about the Ford store, my personal um, view there would be I would like to see a mixed use facility go up where the Ford store is for an RFP. So, like, that would be my desired result of an RFP at the Ford store is like retail commercial space on the bottom and a couple stories of condos or apartments on top. Uh, can I ask a question about developing this rural fire fire district is uh, it seems like that's been kind of slow to get off the ground um, is there something that needs to be done for for us to be well so right now um, our primary our fire chief is the liaison and um, you know I, I think they he does a really good job you know speaking with them about the the nuts and bolts of the fire operations um, I tend to have more communication with the, the, the joint EMS group, mm -hmm. and so I might try to communicate because there's a lot of shared people that work on the EMS side uh, for the townships that also then work on the, the fire district or the mm -hmm. rural fire group side. Um, so I think there's a lot of misconceptions and misunderstandings about why you would do a, a, a fire district, and, and I think there's a lot of fear about loss of control, and it's a money grab, and there's all these things that that are out there and so i think getting to the table and starting to talk to them about not even what we want to accomplish by doing it but just trying to understand what their fears and misunderstandings might be mm -hmm. um I, I think if if i start taking maybe a more active role um maybe through the ems group trying to get those contacts that might okay. be a way to to go about it and, um, I, and i think that's great but i also think that's a discussion for another agenda item yeah. oh. It, it is. It's kind of verging off that yeah. way, but I'm I'm also thinking in terms of um, you know financing a fire station. It would 
certainly seem like we, it would yeah yeah it, can it, we, we request to the, have a discussion on that at a future go for sure i think that's a good idea yeah um go ahead alder trina oh, or alder <coughs> reed <laughs> alder trina <laughs> now both are correct <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, no, this discussion is just so important, and we're finally having it. We just, again, really should have been doing this months ago, and the timing is awful right before the election. I, I mean, the words are the, good, the timing and is it's, awful. It's, yeah. it's horrible. I, I just, um, yeah, I mean, I want to keep talking about this, but in one evening and then trying to vote. Right. Well, for now, yeah. the big purpose for tonight is I would like to see us start going to RFPs on one or all of the properties. So that's kind of, we have a consensus to go to RFP on Dingy for sure. Um, just trying to get a consensus on if we want to go to RFP for the others. And I would also like to point out that this discussion on the Dingy property wouldn't have been possible months ago because we didn't own it. Um, you can't really go to RFP or create a plan for a property that you don't own. That would be like me trying to make a plan for my neighbor's garden. That is not how things work. So we couldn't have had this conversation about Dingy three months ago. Go ahead, Alder Steiner. Um, I agree that we should probably take an RFP on all three properties mm -hmm. uh, just to give our options. We don't have to accept literally any of them when mm -hmm. it comes to us. Um, as far as the DPW, which is probably the most important one we have, Agreed. I had a question there. The recycling center, was there any space out there to build a facility for DPW? I, I think that's where you would look to add a, at least a part of your campus. The, the part towards the river has some floodplain there. Um, <clears throat> I think if your stormwater efforts are successful, you might see that improve on future flood maps or you could potentially build up a little bit um, there's the parcel between there and uh, the wastewater plant um, it, it's on the market but it's um, it's there's a question on the status of the the soil and things like that and we weren't certain about the status of that um, further down you have butterfly uh, garden and you know that's currently being used but the understanding is if we ever wanted to develop there that would also be um, some place that we could uh, put something if we needed to uh, so there are other options down there if we needed to go that direction right thank thank you alder Steiner. Oh, alder motive i just was gonna echo i think it makes sense to go to rfp on all i think we're foolish not to get opinions on all of them before we make our decision okay no, I think those are all good points. Um, any um, feedback or notes on things that we would like to see at the pro other properties when we go to RFP? I agree with the mixed option for countryside, yeah. residential, and tower. Yeah. Can we keep the uh, community garden if we go to residential on tower? We don't know yet. I'd like to see that happen if it was possible at all. But And, and we have made preliminary uh, preparations to have the community garden move out to, to butterfly and there was some concern on that yeah. from community <laughs> members that a garden with butterflies wouldn't get along with vegetable gardens but I think we can make it work um, and we've already made some of the preparations for that so okay any other thoughts I'm sorry sir it's not a we Um, let's see here, but I'll, I'm more than happy to take questions or anything after the meeting if you'd like. Um, all right, then we will at our next, we'll move that forward to the regular meeting to, um, go to RFP for all three of those locations. All right, then next up is to review the street closing um, to use Fireman's Park for the run walk event on May 3rd. Much lighter. Did you want to talk to us I at all? I told you was here. <laughs> Sorry, you, you ladies have <laughs> suffered through a lot to get here. We got an education today. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't know if you, ha if you have any questions. We are uh, the CHS CARES. Um, 
We are a high school club that was formed a few years ago um, because we, we have a problem. We have a mental health problem in our community, in the country, and we do at CHS as well and in our school district. So it was brought to our attention through the students. They wanted to have a color run for the whole district um, at Fal Fireman's Park. Um, to kind of raise awareness for our club. Um, the whole goal is to end suicide. That is what our club is all about, is ending suicide, preventing it, and finding uh, places for kids to go, peer support, to find help if they're struggling with something. So um, this is not a fundraiser. This is something that we are putting on ourselves. We actually um, applied and got a grant through DPI to have this um, run. So we're really excited about that. And um, we have a speaker coming in and talking to us throughout the course of the day, um, elementary school in the beginning of the day, and the middle school, and then the high school. And then the runs will happen right after those. Um, discussions or, or presentations. So um, I guess all we really need is some barricades and trash cans. <laughs> Pretty sure that's what we need. Yeah. And awesome. Tony, why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, I am Tony <laughs> McGee. Uh, I am an English teacher at the high school. Um, I've been teaching 31 years, which is a really awesome. long time, and Thank I love you. it. Hard and 20 you. years here, so I'm really proud of this school. I graduated from Columbus, went to school through Columbus, um, very proud community member. Um, and this is Sophia Conley and Lexi Rader, also high school seniors. Oh, great, yeah, leaders of our club. Awesome, thank you so much for coming in here, ladies. It's an, I mean, it is definitely a noble cause. It, is there any questions or concerns? Everybody okay with, it looks like you'd I be closing say, 11 to four. I think it's great. I know there's been a growing problem within young people and, and adults too mm -hmm. over the past few years, all the troubles that we've had and all the status and it, it really it's good to bring the light the problems that need to come over and I think this is a really good opportunity to open up this, this conversation with everyone to say there is a problem and let's let's tackle it. I think and, it's really good. And we're not we're we're taking this you know, the stigma away from it. So it's so supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be like this is like this is where we are right now and if you need help it's not a big deal just to right. go to a, a friend um, the girls are um, green bandana holders and what that means is they have been um, trained by a professional group um, that if someone says that they are considering suicide or they need help that they have a green bandana on their backpacks and that says that they are a safe person to talk to, and then they would get them help. So um, that's who these people are. There's a lot of our yeah. students. We have about 12 members who are green bandana holders. So we are very proud of that, and we are trying to kind of take away some of that um, anxious, that anxiety related awesome. to mental health. Thank you very How much. How can other students get involved? I, I have a high school student, oh, okay. so I'm trying to figure out, you know, I know this would be up his alley. Yeah. How do they get involved? So um, we, <laughs> that is part of something that has happened over the last couple of years with COVID. We haven't been able to like, been able to, you know, make ourselves known. And that's part of what we're doing with this walk. Mm -hmm. So um, every year at the beginning of the school year, we have a club fair. And we have a table at the club fair and kids sign up and then um, once a month we have meetings. So it's just a matter of being aware and signing up for the club meetings and everyone's welcome. Is it too okay. late for this year for no, them? I mean, we, we take kids anytime. Okay. Anytime. Yep. Awesome. Thank and you plus so much. we could use the help with the walk. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll always look for that. Looks like everything is in order. Everybody's good moving this forward. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming in, ladies. So it's been a long night for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. The next up is, let's see here. Where, why did I get lost? Number nine. Number nine. Oh, okay. Yep. Re review and discuss the SMFA um, for Tower Drive. 
did you understand? Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so uh, we just uh, checked in, luckily, uh, to find out about the status of this project. Uh, we did apply for a bipartisan infrastructure law grant. It was an 80% grant with a 20% local match. Um, total project cost was about 900000 Our share is about $191,964. Uh, they said they sent us an email, and it never hit our system. Uh, so they're anxious to get this back. Uh, we're going to have to, as soon as we get this approved at the next meeting, get this off to them. Um, because it's federal funds, we will have to go through a um, uh, QBS process, which basically is a qualification-based. We ignore price, and then uh, we select the most qualified firm uh, for engineering uh, to design it. And I believe uh, for design, our engineer, uh, Rupert Milky, will not be able to bid on that, so we'll have to be choosing a different firm. Um, and then it's kind of a strange process that the we select the most qualified firm and then DOT somehow gets involved and cuts all their prices down to what DOT thinks it should be or, or something along those lines. So uh, stay tuned for more on that, but we have to get this letter approved first. Perfect. Any questions? Everybody okay moving that forward? Awesome. And then next up is to review and discuss the City Hall roofing proposal. And I think Kyle will probably want that one too. Yes. Um, so this goes, uh, we were talking uh, roofs last time. We've been talking uh, roofs a lot lately. Uh, typically when we go to a, a, a large um, a project like this, we like to have multiple quotes and get a lot of competitive information. Um, it has just been a struggle. Um, the library has struggled, uh, utilities have struggled, and uh, so we only really have one uh, proposal for you here at the, the cost for uh, the City Hall roof from Great Lakes Roofing at a cost of $116,350. Um, we tried, uh, previous public works director tried multiple times, multiple methods. Um, we also uh, got a quote for going and getting specs and developing a full spec and going out and publishing a bid. Um, given the environment we're in, we don't think we're going to generate a lot more um, uh, competition. And the quote for multiple buildings to do the specs was forty some thousand dollars. Yeah, that's it, it would no. be less for just the city hall. But again, we don't think we're going to generate more interest. So our recommendation given the ongoing leaking, uh, is to uh, approve the roofing project. Uh, I believe the library today probably just approved the buildings across the street, uh, and uh, utilities last week also approved theirs, all with Great Lakes roofing. So we're asking to uh, move this forward so we can get on their agenda and uh, get our roof fixed. And um, I have in here the uh, flat roof. Uh, roof includes 15-year labor warranty on the flat roof, 20-year product warranty, and the shingles on the Mansard come with a two-year labor warranty and limited lifetime warranty on the shingles themselves. Right. And no, I mean, I think it makes sense to just move forward. Honestly, $116,000 as someone that looks at roofs quite frequently for, well, I just replaced my own and I work with customers that have to do it. That's not even double the cost of my personal residence roof. So yes. and we that's did budget, a really good price. Uh, $115,000, so we'll be making up the extra $1,000 yeah. in the budget. Yeah, it's, I, I don't think spending $42,000 is logical because there is no way in heck we are getting a quote forty-two grand less than that. No, so. I think $119,000 is awesome. Yeah, it really so is. So I'm 100% I'm on board with getting this yeah. done. Plus, then we need to have the roof done so that Helen can do her thing. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Oh, go ahead, Alderie. Oh, uh, yes. I just want to confirm that the library board did vote to replace both of the roofs today. And I'm so excited to hear that this one will be replaced also. Um, this gives us a little more breathing room right. for the repairs on the inside. Thank right. you. Yeah, the auditorium won't degrade as quickly, at least. Um, let's see here. Then next, well... The next up is to convene to close session per 19.851E, deliberating or negotiating the purchase of public properties, the investment of public funds, or conducting other public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. Specifically to discuss TID 6, uh, conceptual project review agreement for Commerce Center Lot 5, discuss a lease for 1149 West James Street and Midwestern LLC. 
Alder Motif will make a motion to move to closed session per 19851E. I have a motion from Alder Motif and a second from Alder Steiner. If you could please take a roll call for us. Arnold? Aye. Gray? Aye. Motif? Aye. Reed? Aye. Steiner? Aye. All right. Aye. Motion carries. Well, thank you for coming, everyone. Um, we won't be going back onto the air tonight for any um, further deliberation. Um, so have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.